Hello, I'm Gary Schaefer, Director of Glendale Library Arts and Culture. On behalf of all the public libraries in Los Angeles and Ventura counties and beyond, thank you for joining the Southern California Library Cooperative and my library for this event, which is part of our Be the Change series, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism. Be the Change events build collective understanding of systemic racism, elevate the voices and stories of Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color, and inspire our communities to be the change. The series is generously supported by the City of Glendale Arts and Culture Commission and Outlook newspapers. Tonight, in honor of Armenian Genocide Remembrance Month, we are pleased to be hosting the authors of Lavash, the bread that launched 1,000 meals plus salad, stews, and other recipes from Armenia. Ara Zeda is chef, recipe developer, food writer, and bow hunter who has appeared on shows such as Marcus Samuelson's No Passport Required. He lives in Los Angeles. John Lee is an award-winning photojournalist specializing in gastronomy. He was a staff photographer for the Ch Chicago Tribune he has photographed pictures for more than two dozen cookbooks. He is joining us from Singapore, where I believe it is approximately 9.31 Friday morning. So thanks for joining us, John. Uh, also on our panel is Kate Leahy. Uh, she is an award-winning food writer, collaborator, and recipe developer. Her books have taken her from Minamar to Armenia and many places in between. She lives in San Francisco. Interviewing our panelists this evening is Los Angeles-based Helen Gregorian, sorry, it's Helena, correct? <laughs> uh, who is the creator and founder of Circles Six, a boutique creative agency based here in Glendale. She's also the tastemaker behind The Cookbook Hunter, a blog featuring recipes and stories from more than 2000 cookbooks collected and rescued from around the world. And now I'll turn the virtual mic over to Helena. Helena? Thank you, Gary, for the introduction. And hello, everyone, and welcome to Lavash Art Third Talk as part of the Be the Change series. Thank you, Tiffany, Isis, and everyone at the Glendale Library Arts and Culture for making this event happen. And thank you to our special guests, the authors of Lavash, Kate Leahy, John Lee, and Ara Zeta. Thank you for making the time in your busy schedules to be here virtually. We are here tonight to celebrate this wonderful cookbook, Lavash, the bread that launched a thousand meals plus salads, stews, and recipes from Armenia. And personally, I know I could spend hours gushing over this book. And as an Armenian American, when I first heard about this book, I was over the moon. It's a collection of, rest of Armenian recipes curated directly from the regions of Armenia. And once you get the book in your hands, you'll see what a treasure of complex yet simple recipes, captivating stories, and some of the most exceptional photography showcasing both the food and the country. Truly from the first pages, you feel like the fourth passenger in this culinary journey through Armenia. And so without further ado, our authors, Kate, John, and Ada. So thank you guys for being here oh. tonight. And Hi there. I was not muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. It's a treat. <laughs> so we kind of have to start from the beginning and how these stars aligned so perfectly that the three of you connected and wrote this book, wonderful book. All take right. it from well, the top. I'll, I'll take it from the yeah, top. Yeah, so like. So, so it really started, um, and Helena, I know you know this, uh, uh, a restaurant in San Francisco called Burma Superstar. Um, I happened to be working on that project and John Lee was the photographer. So I met John while we were traveling to Yangon to start shooting the book. And the, the, the strange thing was John had just gotten back from Armenia three days before boarding a plane and going to Myanmar. And so John was just like brimming with all these stories from his adventures, his three week adventures all through Armenia. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. Uh, so, 
you know, you got a long flight ahead of you when you're flying across the Pacific Ocean. So he pulls out his, his uh, laptop and starts just just going through some of the photos and actually some of them ended up in the book um wow. and it was just like these captivating images of um you know these monasteries that look you know like they had just been in game of thrones there was you know fish that was drying on the, the banks of lake sevon there was just all this rich imagery and food culture and i thought man there's a book here and i happened to have is strangely enough, because I'm a complete nerd, um, when I was an undergraduate at UC <laughs> Davis, I did a thesis my senior year called Cookbooks and Armenian American Identity. And you can definitely say it's, <laughs> it's such a hard um, book to find now. I'm sure it's a collector's item because I've been trying for it. it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, yes. so, so I kind of, even though I'm not, I don't have any Armenian heritage, I had Armenian friends and it really only takes, you know, knowing one Armenian to to start getting um, a sense of the, the rich, um, just hospitality and culture. Um, and, and so when John was showing me these images, I thought, we got we to figure out a way to, to, to create a book. So, so um, John, I'll, I'll kick it back to you now. Yeah, and, and what Kate was talking about, how it just takes one Armenian friend to kind of get you hooked in. Uh, my my kind of one Armenian friend was uh, is is uh, an old college uh, uh, buddy of mine from San Jose State University, um, Eric Gregorian. Uh, no relation to you, Helena, but there, there's a million Gregorians, I think. So, yeah, but you know Eric, right? Right. Um, and Eric, um, he had moved. Uh, he, you know, he's a Los Angeles. You know, kind of Los Angeles. You know, uh, kind of a San Fernando Valley uh, Armenian American. And I had always thought he was Persian, actually, but, you know, but he's actually, he's Armenian. And um, so he had moved back to Yerevan, we moved to Yerevan because part of the whole repat, repatriation uh, kind of a movement uh, a few number of years back. Uh, so one spring morning, about 2000, spring of 2015, I wake up and I check my email, get my, my phone, just the way it always is next to me. And I look over and I see this email from Eric saying, hey, man, um, do you want to teach uh, food photography to a bunch of you know, high school kids in, in Armenia? I kind of looked at it and I kind of, you know, showed my, my wife, you know, you know, ne next to me, the, the email and she looked at, it, she goes, do it. And I thought, okay, sure. You know? And then I have to uh, uh, embarrassingly say that the next thing I did immediately after that was I had to Wikipedia Armenia. Uh, I knew nothing about it. I'm your typical kind of dumb American that just like, I mean, at that time I was like, well, is, is it full of, is it full of, you know, like ISIS at that time? You know, because, you know, <laughs> that was going on. Then. Um, you know, it's just completely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so then fast forward to, uh, to July of that summer, July, 2015, uh, I find myself on a plane going to Yerevan and I land a Yerevan and I'm like, like you know, what the heck am I doing here? Just kind of, you know, and, and then over the subsequent three weeks, um, I, I was teaching, uh, I was uh, leading a food photography workshop for uh, Tumo, you know, for I'm sure most of you guys here know who Tumo is. Um, I won't go to it's, it's super details, but it's basically, I would say probably the world's, uh, objectively the world's greatest after school program, you know, for kids. Um based in Yerevan. So for three weeks, I was technically the, the workshop leader, but it was them leading me around as I got to, uh, to, to learn and to uh, be exposed to, to this kind of culinary tradition of, of Armenia that I, I really had no idea about, but it was eerily familiar. Um, there was something foundational about the foods there. I mean, maybe it could, because it is crossroads, um, in a certain sense, kind of the early you know, parts of the Silk Road. So there's lots of familiar foods, but it's also at the same time, just different enough and just unique enough that, and also frankly swashbuckling because it's, it's, it's still mostly untapped part of the world that not a lot of tourists go to. So I was, uh, I, I, I was, I was hooked basically. So then when I came back after the three weeks, uh, you know, I was, I was still kind of in, in Armenia, kind of like, you know, kind of heaven. And that's when I showed uh, Kate the pictures. So, wow. so here airplane. we are in, 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 in trying to find tea leaf salad in, in Myanmar. 
and John's still thinking, oh man, this would be so good with lavash, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, but, right, but, yeah. But the story about, um, you know, it's, it's, I have to say that, and Helena, you know, you have enough cookbooks behind you that usually there's one author or maybe two authors on a cookbook. It's, it's pretty unusual to have three authors, but I really yes. think um, the three of us coming together to write this book also kind of talks to the theme of, of what the Glendale Library is, is doing um, with, with, um, with kind of recognizing and dig, digging down into cultures and kind of crossing barriers. Um, but we did know that John and I really were passionate about figuring out a way to make a cookbook, but we knew we needed a team. This wasn't going to be, oh, just randomly, we're gonna to go to this country and meet people and write a book. No, we needed to kind of build like a community around this book and, and we, needed, we needed our ambassador. So uh, Ara, do you wanna <laughs> jump in? And here comes Ara. So, <laughs> so <laughs> voila. Uh, I, I end up meeting John through the Tumo network. And, and interestingly enough, um, I, I didn't grow up going to Armenia as a kid. I went to Armenian school. I grew up in an Egyptian Armenian household, which every, most Armenians are Armenian from somewhere else. It's, it's just because of the genocide and all the things that happened. So they spread out. And I went to Armenia for the first time kind of later in life at the, at the time. I, we, we used to do this talk a lot, but the COVID happened. It was only like a few years before that. So it's been a minute. But um, first time I went to Armenia, I was like, wow, I'm looking for all the foods that I, I grew up on. And I was looking for all the things that I, I, I wanted to eat. And it was just nostalgia for me, but it wasn't anything that I was familiar with. So I was a little bit confused the very first time food wise in Armenia. And when I came back, um, I, I, I started thinking about maybe there's something here. I, sh I need to learn and research a little bit more. When I met John through the Tumo Network, he told me he has an idea for writing an Armenian cookbook. And I was like, well, this is, this is kind of perfect. It's something that I always wanted. I wanted to wrap my brain around already. And so the three of us kind of talked it out. We're like, you know, we're going to do an Armenian cookbook. We had, John had all these pictures. We had uh, this concept of being, calling it Armenia, the cookbook. And we're like, we're going to write a cookbook. It's going to be called Armenia. And we're going to jam it full of recipes. And then we were like, you know what? Every Armenian across the world is going to be like, that's not how you make dolma. That's not how you make this. Every grandma is going to be like, no, this isn't the right way to do things. So we talked about it. We're like, you know what? Let's go to Armenia and let's go village to village all around it and gather recipes straight from Armenia as like a timepiece, as a recognition of what's going on there at that mo moment in time. So nobody can, nobody can say, hey, that's not Armenian. Well, we found this in the middle of a village where the people have never left. So they're eating it there. It's pretty Armenian to me, you know? And so we decided that we're just going to fly out there, mm -hmm. go village to village, gather up what we can, and, and, and slap it into a book and show the world that there is a cuisine, that there is this Armenian kind of, there's a country out there first called Armenia. And there's a cuisine that they have and kind of show the world, which, you know, would come with certain challenges. Kate was, was one of the people I was like, Hey, how are we actually going to gather these recipes? And I was like, well, there's one thing that Armenian has that no, you know, I don't want to say no other country has, but Armenian hospitality in general is second to none. And I, I was, Kate had never been there and she had Armenian friends, but she had never been there to experience this this pure hospitality where you can walk into any restaurant, any village, anywhere in the country, and all of a sudden be welcomed in like your family. And they were going to give up over all the trade secrets. And it happened time and time again. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we are fortunate enough to, to be able to write our proposal, get it, uh, get it picked up by Chronicle. And we were, we we're able to, you know, make the initial journey over there, which just spewed into everything that's happened so far. Now, I, once you decided that it was going to be a regional cookbook, did you have a set list in mind? Like, okay, first we're going to go here, there, or was it more <laughs> organic in the sense of like people telling you, you have to go to Artsakh for the Jengelov Hats, or you have to kind of, how did that, how did that happen? So I'll, I'll start with that. It's basically 
John had a list of all the things that he had shot with his students. And I had ideas of what I thought should be in the book as well. And we all kind of agreed we had a hit list. And it turns out that hit list is not really in the book. No. <laughs> as, as we kind of traveled through, everyone, people were like, hey, you got to go here for this. And you got to go here for that. And I mean, one of the things that led us through was going to Artsakh for Jingle of Hots. Um, I mean, John could tell a little bit about his experience from before there as to his travels with us. Um, but, so, so when, uh, so when I, you know, kind of was, was holding that, the, the workshop for you know, food photography, uh, a lot of, of the ideas came from uh, the, the Tumo folks, specifically Mari Lu Papazian, who's the director of Tumo. Um, she's passionate about food and she's, um, uh, and I think it was actually her idea actually to do a food photography workshop. Um, so, uh, so she was the one that kind of, kind of pointed once I introduced, you know, her, you know, her to, to Kate and she had already known Ara. Uh, she was the one that really kind of initially gave us the, you should go check this place out. I know this person take, you know, I can take you here. Uh, she drove us, uh, uh, uh personally, uh, to Artsakh multiple times, right. Um, if not, you know, you know, personally, you know, she would also just make two phone calls or one phone call, boom, whatever. <laughs> um, so, so it was, uh, um, I mean, she was kind of like the initial catalyst. And then from there, it just kind of spread out because you meet one person that one person has an idea. The next person you have this other idea, you know? Um, uh, yeah, no, Kate, I mean, uh, you, yeah. you know, well, one of the things that was also interesting is, um, you know, like R said that originally we were going to have like Armenia, the cookbook. And then, you know, we ended up what what book we kind of created in our proposal was, all right, let's let's not do Armenia, the cookbook. Let's call it Lavash because Lavash is eaten with everything. So no matter what, we knew we needed a killer Lavash recipe. And, and so and that came pretty early on in our research. We knew we had to track down Lavash. But what happened when you're tracking down Lavash is you meet all these other people uh, on the way. And then it was like, oh, Jenga love hots. You have to go to Sipana Carrot. And if you go there, bring me back some too. Um, well, are you going to do Matnakash? And then, I mean, I think I remember like just, oh, what about, what about this? What about that? And all of a sudden, we're sitting on a, a balcony making trout wrapped in lavash with tarragon and butter and it's like well that's going in the book because it's delicious so it really was kind of like a game of telephone i you know i'll have to dig up our original recipe list but i mean we had things in there that they just don't need in armenia or we just got sidetracked because we found so many other things that we that that kind of spoke to us yeah and 100 so, percent. and you know you talk about you know you're writing that uh, paper in high in in I was gonna say high school in college feels like high school. <laughs> I was like I know right so long ago um not at all like five years ago for you that and Anna <laughs> you and I growing up in these in these households where we talk about Armenian food and what we thought was Armenian food is what Kate wrote about being Armenian food that must have been such almost like a culture shock when you go to these villages and nothing looks from you talk about nothing looking familiar nothing 100 percent. i mean we went to certain villages we saw certain recipes through our travels and it was kind of it was insane because the things we grew up with um knowing that they're armenian it wasn't thinking it was knowing yeah. and then you go to armenia and you're like hey i want this and i want the traditional way and they're like what are you talking about you know and they have things like Khashlama, which is awesome, hits close to home for Kate. It's like an Irish stew. She loved it. But as a Western Armenian, <laughs> I was like, where is the spice? Give me the seasoning in this thing. It's it's basically like a like a beef stew with some potatoes and, and some peppers. And the only the things that they use, they don't we're used to spices and seasonings. As as Western Armenians, it's like we have that whole influx of, of like the Middle East that's in, in penetrated our food. And out in Armenia, they season all their food, salt, red pepper, and it's blasted with herbs. And those herbs are what make it Armenian. That's what makes it. It's a, it's a wholesome, um, hearty dishes, heavy grains, heavy herbs, and everything. It, it, it pumps the flavor of what ingredients they use. And it's, it has this, it, its own natural beauty to it. Um, Kate was talking about the, the lavash recipe that we, we needed to, we needed to get now out here in LA, you want lavash, 
We go to the store. Lavash is there for us. Nobody makes lavash here. Yeah. In Armenia, I mean, there's there's lavash, but all the houses, all the villages, all the people, a lot outskirts, they make their own lavash. So they they get in these villages. We would go to. They have um, a tonian, which is an in ground oven, in each one of these households or villages, and they would do these lavash bakes for the winter for each household. So all the women would get together. They bake lavash together for the winter of one household. Then in the next day or the next week, they do it for the next household. And then what they do is they stack lavash into like bedrooms and they dry them. So you air dry it. And now you got these bedrooms filled with lavash stacks. And you, whenever they want a fresh lavash through the winter, they would just grab a piece of this dried lavash, spritz it with a little bit of water, wrap it up in a towel, fresh lavash is there. These are things that we didn't know anything about. And, and through our travels, we found some cool, small, little, little things that you wouldn't expect. Um, and it was just, it was, it was very enlightening. Let's put it that way. We, we also, you know, it, I think sometimes being um, the three of us being from outside Armenia helped us ask the dumb questions. I mean, so we were convinced that there was a soup made of uh, poison ivy. So we were yes. tracking down poison ivy soup and we had to figure out like, where is this point? Cause John was like, well, you know, I, I mean, I ate the soup and it was like, well, did anything so, happen? He was like, no. Yeah. yeah so, so dur during my, um, dur during the, the 2015 food, photo uh, you know, food photography workshop, uh, I was, uh, taken to, um, to, uh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, our, uh, car, uh, uh, Dilijan, Dilijan. Sorry, Dilijan. Dilijan. and uh, we were at a, we were at a, a, a you know at a restaurant uh, in the kitchen with the chef, and he was cooking up this one thing. It was some sort of kind of greens, and he was kind of you know cooking up for a while, boiling it and turning it into some sort of a soup. And I was like, oh, and, you know, like what is that? And I had a translator with me, and the translator, you know, was like, oh, that's that's poison ivy soup. I'm like, whoa poison ivy like you can eat poison ivy and they're like yeah you just boil it for a while i'm like okay you know like maybe it's kind of like the same thing if you boil if you cook uh alcohol enough it eventually goes away if you, you boil you know the poison ivy enough the, the poison goes away and you can eat it so i'm like oh my god it's poison ivy so i kept telling kate and Ara, i saw poison ivy soup my like, god and it wasn't until i think when we went back to armenia it was in 2018 uh and we went looking for it they're like no 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 it's nettles which you know, just oh, different, right? I mean, yeah. So it was, but we had yes, to see yeah, the nettle soup. Themselves. We had to see the greens and, see, and recognize the leaf shape and think, oh, now I understand. I mean, nettle stink right. if you don't touch them right way. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, because because the picture I had taken of the at that time what I thought was poison ivy soup, you know, it was the it was you know, see, see the leaves inside, and I kept googling like what is poison ivy, poison oak, like comparing and looking at the difference, and it was inconclusive. It was hard to tell exactly what it was until we actually saw when we went back to that kitchen and the, right, right, exactly. So yeah, um, but one of the things, the yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one of one of the dishes that, that was, was the biggest shock of the whole trip. John had told us about this dish that he had photographed with his uh, students. Uh, basically was cheese and lavash oh. and water. And I was like, that sounds terrible. This is the worst dish ever. <laughs> we need to find this thing. And, and it was towards the last leg. So we had, we, we basically drove all the way around Armenia. And at the very, very end, we were kind of at Gyumri. And this is where we were going to find this dish called Banarkash. And I was like, this is probably the most disgusting thing that we're ever going to eat. But we need to know what's going down. It turns out that this is the, probably one of the most made dishes that I make out of the book. Every time we have a party, somebody says Banarkash. Basically, they take, and, and you can't go to a restaurant and find this. This is what your grandma would make you at home for a quick meal. Like nobody makes this. We asked them to make banokash at a restaurant and they made this awesome stuff. And they're like, why, what are you talking about? So it's more or less lavash. They cut it up and they layer it with cheese and lavash and cheese and lavash and cheese and lavash, then caramelized onions with butter on top. And then they pour hot water in it and then they bake it. And you're like, this doesn't sound good at all. But when it comes out of that oven, that cheese and water oh, has melted into a cheese sauce. And what you have is Armenian mac and cheese. Oh, that's and it's mind-blowing. Oh. It's mind-blowing. 
Like yeah. even your description, your simplicity, it sounds, del- I mean, I don't know what part of that you were like, it doesn't sound good. It absolutely sounds, it's bread so, but, and onions. Yeah, it's mac and cheese or in Germany, it would be, it'd be Kaiserspechle if it was in German. Yeah. I mean, like every culture has something yeah. similar yeah, to yeah, that, right? Culture. You know, it's this is comfort food. It is. It's yeah. all of When our- you tell somebody, you tell somebody cheese, water, and bread in a bowl, I'm like, no. But if you <laughs> describe it with your arms... <laughs> Well, there's a difference. Well, there's a difference. That's why we need this. See, you need this. <laughs> you know, but like, it, when you talk about these dishes and the lavash, most importantly, was there a difference in the type of lavash you saw from north and south, east and west Armenia? You know, uh, actually, not not a whole lot. The biggest difference would be the the tonier setup and and whether it was you know a, a real sort of um, wood burning tonier in the ground. Um, other than that, the what they're using in lavash. I mean, it it was pretty rare to find whole wheat lavash in the places we went. There's only a couple of areas that really make it um, on a regular basis. A, a lot of people just use a basic like what we would call all purpose flour, um, and 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 they make we saw it in different places and the dance the the sort of dance or the you know I I described it as like um you know it's it's people I mean I maybe you're some Dodgers fans out in the audience but it's like you're yeah. throwing um you know you're you're warming up before a game and you're just throw like they throw lobs of dough at each other and then one woman will roll it out and and toss the the dough over to the next woman and then she'll stretch it and then give it to the next woman who hits it against the the side of the the wall of the tony or it, it is very much like like an infield right right exactly there's, yeah, there's like, like a an catcher infield, you know, right. pitcher first base and yeah very much you're, similar yeah you're incredibly skilled at this so um and it wasn't just and we saw different women do it and it was always women that was the one consistent thing it was always women making the lavash even chopping the wood for the lavash i mean it was it was definitely um uh, uh just you know and also like you didn't want to get in their way because they were pros, you know, like, just like with pro, you're kind of in awe, you're watching them. Um, so Ari and I had this experience where we had all these questions because we were trying to figure out how we could replicate it and how, how much, you know, they used yeast, but it was more of like, um, like you would call a poolish or a pre-ferment in, in a more traditional baking terms. Um, it was a piece of dough left over from the batch before that they would add to the new batch. And it was just enough to give it a little bit of leavening um, a little bit of pliability, a little bit more flavor than say just adding flour, water, and and salt. So that we have in the book, we call it old dough, but it took a little sleuthing to figure that out. Um, and while we're doing that sleuthing, we, we also don't want to interfere because, you know, the, the, these are the pros. So they, they come to a break in, in their um, production. And, and you can't tell if they're really at that point, since they're so focused on what they're doing, you can't really, we couldn't tell at that point if they were happy to see us or if we were just being, you know, frankly, just pains. Like, hey, can we get rid of these folks? Um, How much are they, they going to be here? They, they come back and they've got like this pot of just boiled potatoes and they've got some pickles um, and, and they, they have hot lavash and they give us this piece of uh, lavash wrapped in a hot potato. Mm-hmm. Potatoes just boiled with salt and water, but it tastes like it's basted in butter. And R and I look at each other and we're thinking, we're going to eat potato wrapped in yes. bread. Like here, here's another one of these. A potato bread. sandwich. This is so LA. Potato sandwich. <laughs> here we go. This is like the anti- carb on carb. Right. Right. Carb, 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 salt. Right, yeah. And so, and we take yeah. a bite and it's this amazing experience of just the buttery tasting potato. That's just one of the best potatoes I've ever eaten. Um, the, the perfect lot, like smoky sort of pliable but just crispy lavash and um we eat hot, a hot out lavash. of the tonier lavash and it's just so you know, good yeah. so good um and you could tell they were really really um happy to to share what they were making with us we were not impeding on their privacy or their just workflow they just really wanted to have us you know they made us after that we had some some coffee together so it's it, it really yeah. like uh, the hospitality yeah. I've, I've never experience that kind of hospitality um anytime uh, uh, working on a cookbook K- K- Ara, to, to uh helena was asking about the different types of you know kind of if there were any variations of lavash um but uh, which got me thinking about the 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 little anecdote that you that you two had talking with that minister in artsakh about the difference between what they make in armenia versus what they make in artsakh do you guys want to talk about that <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it was it wasn't the nicest thing he said, but in yeah. in, in our in Armenia, there's lavash everywhere. It's like, it's like a it's to, like a little bit of a dig. Yeah, yeah he kind of was a little bit of a dick move. We went, we met with a minister of culture, right? Or uh, and and he, we were talking about some of the recipes that they had and things like that, and then. We said, is, is there lavash out here? And he goes, no, in, Arme in, in Armenia, they make lavash. In Artsakh, we make tonid hots. And tonid hots is, is like basically tonid, which is what they cook it in, and bread. It's more of a leaven, a little more traditional bread. It's more like a madnakash. And basically, he's like, in Artsakh, we make tonid bread because we don't need to run. And like we were like, that's, a, that's kind of a jab. That's kind of mean, <laughs> especially because we're like the lavash people. <laughs> Well, well, it, it, but but also I think that. part of right right yeah no, but part of it also is because like lavash is is portable right the idea is that you you, you make it and you roll it up you go right you know so right exactly. right so hence the whole kind of like we don't run you know kind of thing so. yeah um, yeah it was so uh, the, the, well, there was a there's a question about spices I think that the, on the chat uh, yes and there, so sorry go, go ahead go so spice wise question. That was it. Um, were there any spices that were common throughout all of the regions? Hundred percent. So, so a, a standard standard practice is uh, ag salt, garmin biber, which is more like it's red pepper, but it's like very very mild, more like paprika. And there's urts in like everything and green herbs. So urts is thyme. So a lot of seasonings. There is the urts in it, and they use urts, which is thyme, but they call everything urts as well, which gets a little confusing. Kate and I had a, I, we're pre, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna toot our own horn, but we're pretty good at what we do. But everything is urts, so we're like, just show it to us. They have urts from the mountains, and then there's urts from the flatland, and then there's the regular urts, and then there's wild urts, and we're, so we we need to, we can't just, there aren't that many times out there. So we, we, after a bunch of research, looking at things like the mountain urts, we're like, oh my God, this is summer savory. So this is savory, this is an urts. And this urts, this is regular time. And then this is, this is sorrel. Everything turns out to be sorrel though. That's the, that's the crazy that's part. The that's the mystery one because there's, I mean, it, it, Armenia is so lush. Um, there's so many different greens that grow out there. A lot of them we probably don't even, never even seen out here. So they have similar names for a lot of the things, but a lot of the times they call things urts. But as for regionally, every single place you'll see salt, red pepper, and then the abundance of herbs. And that herb bouquet is, is what I like to identify as Armenian cuisine. You can go to a store and get what's called charm ganchi, right. which is mixed greens. And at every store, there is a bouquet. It looks like a bouquet of flowers they'll hand you. And it's, it's uh, thyme, purple basil, uh, cilantro, parsley, sometimes dill, savory. And it's literally just, just herb bouquet. And they take it. And what together. they do, yeah, yeah it's tight. And then they cut it in half, stems and all, chop it up. And it goes in everything. Like literally everything. <laughs> It makes it makes it magical. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm just getting so hungry what, 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 for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What what I really love about it, what what uh, captivated me about the food in Armenia, and it has to do with maybe because okay, so you know how you know, we get to like French cuisine, you get to um, you know, and maybe it's, you know Italian cuisine, but definitely like say French, it becomes so um, scientific or so kind of you know. Uh, um, uh, so kind of scholarly, whereas when you get to places that are a little bit more kind of folk, um, you know, kind of folk recipes where it's, it's the grandma, you know, kind of just, you know, going out foraging for various random greens, who knows what it is. And, you know, and, you know, everything becomes because they don't know the difference necessarily between, you know, summer savory and sorrel and whatever. It's just wild herbs. Uh, mm. Be, co combine that with also the going back to the the difference between eastern and western armenian food that eastern highest stansi food um is influenced so much by soviet era because it was for what 50 some odd years a soviet satellite state so it it has this and culture not even just food but also even in terms of the architecture and 
uh, and the way that the people in terms of even also, you know, you know languages, right? They, you know, it's Armenian first and, and Russian second. Uh, that that there is kind of interesting kind of meld between, you know, between the, the Russians in the north and then also this kind of uh, not quite Levant food. It's not quite Turkish and it's not quite Persian. Uh, it's just, to me, that's incredibly fascinating. And what makes, what differentiates uh, high Stansi food from, you know, like say this food that, that Ara grew up with. So. Yeah. And were there recipes that the book highlights all these local ingredients and you talk about these herb bouquets and all these, were there, recipes that you had like this one is definitely going to go in the book but once you came back to the states and you tried replicating them you just felt like it's 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 i can't i can't quite get it i can't quite get it can, can i'm sure there's a lot of those I, the, the nice thing was a lot of these recipes um a lot of the, re I mean, the hardest thing really is to replicate the exact herbs. Like Ara was saying, there's certain things that are growing, especially in places like Arsak, um, where they just don't grow in other places. But other things are amazingly easy to find. Like you can get really good beans. Like we had a whole bean tutorial. There was a bean dish that we did. We had so many great ideas for beans that we actually didn't put that one in the book because we just had, it was like, we can't have bean this, bean this, bean this, bean this. It's all, like the flavors were a little bit too similar. And one of them was um, this this really remarkable home cook. She took, um, she made a huge pot of beans and I think she made at least five things out of the in pot. In the town of Goris. In, right. In, in Goris. And Goris beans. Right. And one of them was she ran the beans mm -hmm. through a meat grinder to make like a pate. So this would be actually really trendy now because of the whole plant-based, you know, movement. So she made like a bean pate with like a pat of butter in the center and then wrapped it up. And, and she kind of like wrapped it up really tightly in, um, in plastic. So then you could chill it and then you could slice it like it was a terrine or a, pa a pate, mm -hmm. but it was all beans. Um, and yeah, we had, we had Godis. So Godis is famous for their beans. You go down to Godis, which is the closest Armenian city to Artsakh and everyone's like you go to Goris for the beans and this lady really killed it with the beans for us she, we sat there and we're in her house she made seven bean dishes huh. and that that Armenian hospitality came through and we were there to eat seven bean dishes like bean soup bean pate I mean, the, the bean lavash triangles was something that, that uh, is in the book That's one of my favorite recipes it's so good. It's like a little bean samosa. So it's bean spread with onions. And then you just roll up that lavash in there. But I mean, needless to say, when we left that place, the bean in the car ride really gave it to us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it was like, Helena. Right. This is like two brothers from other mothers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But the, I have, but, all, but, my, but going, I have all my tabs of, of the things that I love. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, I, I can't highlight it enough. And I know that since, but, yeah. you, since this book has come out and, you know, so much has changed since its first publication in 2019, and this past week, like I, when I was going through the book, I got really emotional. And especially when you get to Artsakh and it's really hard and Lavash goes to the places that were, that were, that are impacted by these aggressions. Can we talk a little bit about your experiences in Artsakh and the impact that it had on you then and now reliving some of these stories and what you've seen in the news and what's happening there? I mean, it's, it's tough. It's hard. We, when I first went to Armenia, we, I went to Artsakh and you would see it's, it was very war torn. Um, they were still reliving the first war. Um, and then there was another, there was a two day war after that. And there was, there's, I mean, you see cables across mountains and you say, what are these cables for? They're like, those are so the helicopters or the drones don't come through. So that was the first trip I went out there. When we went out there together, um, I think a total of three times together, I think uh, uh, two or three times. And a lot of the places we went, some of the wineries, I mean, they're not ours anymore. I mean, a lot of the regions we went through, we saw the beauty of Artsakh and we saw the people. And there was something, you did feel this and we felt it too. Everybody in Artsakh was also kind of living on edge. And, and we felt it was like, at, it was at any moment, something was going to happen. And, and we, we got that feeling from them. It was very unfortunate. And I mean, looking through 
a lot of the pictures that we've uh, John has taken and a lot of the places that we've been through, like say it, it does hurt, you know, you're like, I was just there and now we can't go there. Um, we did should we, should, collectively. For, go ahead, John. Should, should we, should we give a quick 30 second kind of primer on what art sock is, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, what's the, the I mean, quick, I mean, without getting into a two hour discussion, like a quick 30 second background about what art sock is, you know, so uh, Nagorno Karabakh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, who, who wants to take that with that one on? <laughs> so I, I can just, I, you guys, the, I, I think most people here know the situation in, in arts okay. and what is happening and, you know, without becoming too political because we want to be political in the sense of, you know, it, as Armenian Americans, it breaks our heart because that is part of our, our land and, you know, the aggressions that took place is inhumane and unjust and we're every day trying to wrong the you know right the wrong right the wrong yes so um, so right. so we did we did a, a little publication that we it was self-published by the three of us um we, we were asked a lot like what we were doing to give back and i it pained us a lot so what we did there it is. So we did a publication, um, all of John's photos we, through our travels. We, we, we teamed up with, uh, we teamed up with, uh, with, uh, uh, uh amazing art veteran art, art director. Yeah. Uh, Alice Chow, who that, that, that we had known from, uh, from previous kind of, you know, chronicle books and publications. Yeah. And she's the, she was the one that came up with this idea actually. So it's a beautiful, it's a, and if you can, I don't know if you guys are still public publishing this, it, but if you can't, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous publication. It, um, it's still it's still available on Etsy. Um, that's the basically our outlet for it. Um, and then all the donation, everything that we get from it goes back to Armenia. So after the, the printing costs, uh, everything we just it's it's strictly to give right, right. back. Yeah, and to show show the world Artsakh, the beauty of Artsakh, what we saw. It, it's through our view, John's lens. Um, there are, there's about four or five recipes that are very specific to Artsakh. Those are the recipes we found in Artsakh. Um, and a lot of those places that we visited and those pictures that you see are, I mean, we can't go. So it, it's painful. It sucks. And this is kind of us putting a stamp like, Hey, there is this place called Artsakh. This is it. Here's your opportunity to kind of take a look yes. um, at, at how we saw it. Yes, definitely. And, and, and it's, it's a, it's, it's heartbreaking and hopefully soon. Well, um, that's a, that's a discussion for another, another right. session. So right, right, you right. Have a question. we can go into, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can go into, we can go into a lot of, uh, painful details, but yeah. all we know is that Artsakh is officially part of Armenia and it should always be recognized. Always, oh. always. And It'll always be here. The, but has the book, um, it looks like piqued the interest of any chefs who would otherwise not have explored Armenian cuisine. Well, one of the, the actually what was interesting is um, there was, we were approached by a, um, a chef in Montreal who is not Armenian, mm -hmm. but she is really fascinated in the food of the Caucasus. And she um, found our book, I think it was through Instagram, it was before a book had come out and she wanted us to go to Montreal to do an event because she is opening up, um, I, I believe, um, a restaurant about the food of the Caucasus. It's, so she had been- Yeah, to it's actually Caucasus. open now. It's called, it's called June, J-O-O-N. We're gonna give her a, a plug. Uh, yeah. If you're ever yeah. in Montreal, <laughs> if you go to J-O-O-N. Um, yeah. Actually, in fact, I'm gonna look up. Uh, um, it's, it's, she's uh, I, it just, uh, yeah, Resto yeah. June. Her right, name yeah. is Aaron Mahoney. That's cool. Oh, that's yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. And so I have I have an interesting. Um, uh, it's I, this might be a tough one, and I don't know if you can answer it, but would there be a favorite lavash? Like, if you had to, if I could magically pin drop you into one of these little toner, I don't know if you could, if you really want to answer. One hundred. I got it. I yeah, yeah hundred percent. Is this okay? Let's this see if everybody has vote. the same. Okay. It's it's definitely odd girl. It's okay. definitely yeah. odd girl yeah. Uh, yeah. slash Lusa kit, but it's 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 actually odd girl. We spent a lot of time with them. We spent a lot of time with a lot of other lavash that's, makers. That's where this it, comes. The cover. That's comes. where that the picture. Most of the pictures of lavash are from the lavash ladies in odd girl. Um, they there's a lot of good lavash. 
it's what, it's a little bit north. I want to say north west yes. of Yerevan. Okay. Northwest of Yerevan. Uh, it's, so, it's technically it would be it'd be suburbs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the and, amazing and, stories about this, um, one of the amazing stories about this um, this village, this Argel Bakery, um, is that it was so popular locally. I mean, just word of mouth, people knew about this bakery. Um, and we saw um, the general manager of the bakery. She also did all her calculations using an abacus, which is pretty yes. awesome. Yes. Uh, but she, she had a stack <laughs> of, of, of lavash and she put Multicultural. it in a bag and brought it out to the curb. And this little, like the regional bus comes by and she puts the lavash on the bus. Aww. But she explained to us that the bus driver takes the fare from somebody in Yerevan and drives it to a yeah. stop in Yerevan, the person who wants the lavash picks it up at the bus stop. So the bus, the, the, the lavash is taking up a seat on the bus Yeah, and it's commuting yeah. to Yerevan. So <laughs> it's like they're Uber Eats, <laughs> right? You know that's I mean? yeah. <laughs> that's like a the, that just shows Uber that Eats. it shows. Wait, the wait, is there some people? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I see, I see, a, I see a business uh, uh, possibility in Glendale, <laughs> you know, so sort of, some sort of custom Glendale Uber Eats uh, for uh, for lavash, you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> there are many different types of bread here in Glendale. It's not just a, yeah. I mean, lavash here is is great, but I just looking through this book, you realize that you don't even get to see the colors, the ingredients, and you know, John. Again, I, I have to say how much I love as a fellow photographer. Obviously, not to this level, but incredible well, and, I <laughs> work. and you know your your vision, your behind the lens view of what Armenia is is so fascinating. And if you could talk a little bit about some of the adventures you've had, because I know that there's a few stories that you shared that are really fascinating. With your photography. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think I was just reacting to 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 the Armenia that was presented in front of me. Like I was so inspired by it. You know, sometimes you go to a certain places, you're just like, oh, you know. And then there's some certain places, at least for me, that I just can't stop taking pictures. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and Armenia is definitely that, one of those. Um, uh, it because it, it, it's just, it's just it's 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 interesting and beautiful. It's I mean I use the word swashbuckling a lot, you know, um, uh, off the beaten path, but yet familiar and everyone's warm and hospitable. It's, it's just really great. Um, so, but but, but maybe uh, Helena, what you're you're referring to as far as some of the adventures or misadventures yes. uh, <laughs> that we had during this. So so when we were planning on okay so we had got, we had gotten the cookbook uh, deal through Chronicle Books and we we're like great okay let's start planning our trip to to go to Armenia and the question is like do we go during you know you know, you know summer do we go during fall harvest do we go during spring and and then thinking in terms of like you know when our our book deadline was going to be and all these things so we decided that the the best timing for us for in terms of food as well as um, as well as uh, uh, you know, kind of cookbook you know uh, production deadlines was going to be March and April of 2018. We're like, great, and we had planned that six seven months in advance, and you know we had booked our tickets and our Airbnbs and everything. Uh, and then and about also, a month also we out, wanted to, we also right, wanted to get the 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 Armenian genocide memorial. We wanted to get some of right, those right, shots right, 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 right. So sure April we 24th, right. We want to make sure April, May. I'm sorry, that. it was April, May. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. April, May. April, we May. There, right. Right. Uh, so that right, exactly. So we want. want I, I really needed to have the 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 genocide memorial uh, somehow represented in the book, and I just didn't want to go when I was angry. Or I want to go at least, you know, uh, to see it, and you know, even with the ring of flowers. Um, so so we had planned to go and everything, but then about a month prior, all of a sudden, I'm looking at uh, Facebook and seeing all you know, our our, our friends in Armenia kind of posting about this kind of like grassroots movement that's happening. Like, Oh my God, what's going on? Um, it turns out, I mean, it was the early stages of the velvet revolution, um, you know, with, with Nikol Pashinian. And when we got there, we, we had, so when I landed there, the plan was that I, uh, I landed there with, with, um, with the art director, uh, uh, Alice Chow, the one that, that was responsible for the art sock uh, publication. Uh, so she went with us. So she and I, we both met in Yerevan and we were going to be there for, I think about 12, 14 hours before Kate and Ara showed up. 
So it was like the Sunday morning, and it's like, okay, fine, whatever. You know, I was just gonna go kind of tour around, um, uh, show show Alice a little bit about you know of Yerevan, you know, go to a couple of temple, or you know, a couple of places, monasteries, and uh, and then all of, all of a sudden, at some point, we kind of fell into uh, it was a protest. So it was basically it was a, a, a Nikol Pashinian kind of a march, you know, through the streets of Yerevan. Um, and I, I won't go super detailed because I mean, it gets kept pretty detailed, but basically it turned out to be like the one day where it was actually a pretty violent protest. My background is in photojournalism. Um, so what happens then is that it just becomes a knee jerk thing. When I see kind of, you know, just you know, stuff going on, I go towards it usually. I mean, it's a, it's very much of a knee jerk reaction. So at some point, all of a sudden I put on my, I see what the protest, it was probably a thousand people. And I put on the photojournalism hat, essentially, and I just kind of go running in there and I'm shooting and shooting and shooting. Um, but all the while knowing that like my entire time in, in Armenia, and I, by then I had been to Armenia about total about six weeks, five, six weeks. Uh, so it, Armenia is an incredibly safe country. Everyone knows each other. It's so hospitable, super safe. So I never felt in danger whatsoever. Um, but so I'm shooting the, the, the protests and everything. And at some point it became the Nikol Pashinian kind of a rally, you know, protesters against uh, the, the Yerevan police though, or paramilitary. And, and it's the one day where there was kind of, not only really, I would say it's a, it was a riot, but it was definitely, uh, uh, I'm shooting. And then the police grabbed Nikol Pashinian. They arrested him essentially. They, they, they threw him into a, a, some sort of a, a van or a truck and uh, uh, you know, big melees happening. And then within probably 30 seconds to a minute later, uh, as I'm shooting and everyone's kind of running around a uh, one of those flash grenades that, 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 uh, that police and military used to disperse crowds. Uh, I guess they threw one in there. It coincidentally, uh, the very first one landed and exploded right at my feet. Uh, literally, I would say maybe a foot away from my feet and exploded the shrapnel, the plastic shrapnel from that thing came up in a rip through my pants and into my, into my legs. Uh, yeah. And I, and I, and I, and yeah, and I was all bloodied up. <laughs> so, so I, you know, uh, you know, going to, to, to Armenia, to, a safe Armenia to shoot a cookbook. And next thing you know, I'm in the, I'm in a, uh, a, a, a year of an ER, you know, you know, getting, you know, getting shrapnel kind of, you know, taken out of my, my legs and stitched up. So now I, uh, I won't show you guys in, in you know, in, <laughs> on this, but I have this nice big scar on my, on my inner thigh now, um, which I guess I have a, I have a, I have a, a, a an old kind of a, a former U S U S Marines friend of mine. And I showed him a picture of, of, of my wounds that he looked at it. He said, luck, luckily it didn't hit uh, the, uh, what I forgot what the, the, the big kind of, uh, big vein that, that, uh, uh, femoral artery. I mean, it was actually probably not too far from the femoral artery. So, so, uh, that was kind of a little scary, you know, like I, I could have, I yeah. could have, uh, could have bled out, I guess. So never, so yeah. Never. So it was yeah. just like one of these things where this this writing this book was the adventure of a lifetime for so many reasons and it was never yeah. never a dull moment right so yeah but, but but as a result though we were so the velvet revolution w w took place in in all about four weeks right we were there for three of the four four weeks so we 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 witnessed the Velvet Revolution from the time that they that 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 Nikol Pashinyan was arrested to the time that he became the 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 acting prime minister. I mean the whole range, and we traveled throughout uh, Armenia during the whole thing, and it was this really interesting, uh, exciting, unique. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience, experience, and we were privileged. We were privileged. To, to be front and center of all this, yeah, just to see this during it. You, know. you and Kate are, you know, uh, honorary Armenians at this point. Yeah, right. right, right. 100%, 100%. I joke, I shed, I shed blood for Heistan. 100%. Right, so for Heistan, so right, yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, this was, this book really is a culinary experience. And when you first find the book, you don't really, you, you expect that regional you don't expect that regional cuisine you expect that rose and all the other Armenian cookbooks and it's such a departure and it's such a it's such an 
a beautiful book. And I, and like I said, like, there's no joke. Like I have all the, the tabs on here and I do go back to this cookbook so many times and I've shared it with so many people because of the, the wonderful stories. And, you know, like I said, going back over this week was very emotional. And, you know, Ada, you talk about your family history. And I think that being that, you know, we are talking about be the change series, you should talk about that, that the year of the sword is, I, I can't get through it without, without crying. It's such a beautiful story. It's, so it's a, it's a pretty intense, um, it's, it's a short, we did a, we, we kind of summarized it in the book. Um, it's, it just kind of tells how my family, uh, where they lived and it was kind of like the start of the genocide and what they kind of had to go through to kind of leave. They uh, were told that they were going to be allowed to stay and live. And then um, my great, great grandfather uh, was an artist and he was painting the mosque. And when he finished, he was told that he would be killed in the morning. Um, but he made friends with the guard and the guard was like, you need to just go uh, take women and children, your family and just go. And they made their way and kind of fled out through. Luckily, um, you know, and a lot of people weren't as fortunate. Uh, they, that area was just a kind of a hub of like death and murder. And it's, it's something that happened. Um, like I said, we we're fortunate, uh, surviving Armenians are fortunate enough to live on. Um, and, you know, the famous words of uh, William Sargon is, you know, when two Armenians meet anywhere in the world, they will create a new Armenia. And, and it's just kind of what we've done as Armenian people. Um, we're survivors. And, and this book is our opportunity to show the world a little bit more about a country that most people don't even know about. Um, you know, this tiny little country where a lot of things began. And, and it, this is just, this is us giving back to the world. Yeah. It's, and thank you for giving back. And thank you for, for putting this publication. Thank you for, Anna, for getting together with everybody and the people at Tumo for getting you guys all together. It's so, it's such a, it's, like I said, I was so excited to hear about the book randomly at a small cookbook store in San Francisco. And since then I've, I've uh, hunted it down and as soon as it came out, I was like on it and I couldn't wait to get it. So yeah. I think that that- <laughs> The plug, plug Omnivore Books in Noe Omnivore Valley, San Books Francisco, in San Francisco. Which is a bookstore. <laughs> Omnivore Books, one of the greatest cookbook stores in, oh, in, in that's all it. of the West Coast. All of the West. Yeah. That is now serving down in LA. Yes. Which is that's it. Cookbook store that, you know, we talk about it's great. There's, there's very few, you know, one closed down sadly in New Orleans. So there's not that many cookbook stores left. So the fact that we have two great ones in one state, we're sorry, John, I know you're not here, but the red, the, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. we have two great. <laughs> yeah. John, you need to move back. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, they, and awesome. so Gary, I think it's our time to get Gary back on the line. If there's anything else, I mean, do we have any more questions? Because knowing us, we could keep going and going. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. I can keep talking I, for hours. I think we finished the questions, but, you know, thank you guys so much. Like, I literally was laughing. I teared up. I mean, this book is, it's more than a cookbook. You know, it's just like there's a little piece of each of your souls in this book. And it's... Um, uh, it's just amazing. So I just want to thank you so much, Ara, John, Kate, and Helena for sharing this illuminating conversation with us. And I would like to invite all of our attendees to visit the Be The Change website to see all of our many upcoming virtual events commemorating Armenian Genocide Remembrance Month. As part of this commemoration on April 19th, Glenda Library Arts and Culture's Reflect Space Gallery will debut the virtual exhibit, Sites of Fracture, Diasporic Imagings of Occupied Artsakh. This exhibition will bring together wow. diaspora and Armenian artists from the United States, 
Canada and Germany to create a collective counter narrative to forces of occupation and cultural erasure in the Republic of Artsakh. So please look for that exhibit on April 19th in, a, in our 3D virtual gallery, which is accept, uh, accessible through the Reflect Space Gallery website at www.reflectspace.org. Uh, our next author event will be on Saturday, April 10th. Uh, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, when Katshig Morodian, author and lecturer, will discuss his new book, Resistance Network. Uh, Dr. Morodian will be in conversation with filmmaker and screenwriter Eric Nazarian. Uh, our next Be the Change Highlight Month will be May 2021, when we will commemorate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Information will be available on this event uh, come May on our Be The Change website. So again, thank you all for joining us this evening and a very heartfelt thanks to our panelists. Uh, please have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's truly been a pleasure.